Welcome back to Conflicts of Interest. This is episode 305. I'm the host, Kyle Lanzalone. Today, joining me is co-host Connor Freeman. Connor, how are you doing? Doing great, Kyle. How are you? Doing well. Excited to have you back on today because you got a bunch of raw news for us. And uh, while it's, I might not be good because it's always bad news, you always give us a thorough breakdown on this Iran issue. So happy to have you on here today, Connor. Just want to remind the audience that they could find the show at the Libertarian Institute on the blog at antiwar.com, YouTube, Rumble, and Odyssey for the video version of the show. You could donate at Patreon or Subscribestar, and you could also donate crypto. All that information is found in the show notes page. You could also help out the show by supporting our sponsor, Paloma Verde. Paloma Verde CBD.com promo code piece that will save you 20% off when you spend $75 or more and it gets the show a kit back. And so you're helping your favorite podcast and getting your high quality CBD products at a great price. Connor, what do you like from Paloma Verde? I strongly recommend the soft gels. They're uh, fast stacking. You take them after a meal and like a half hour later, it'll hit you wherever you've got any kind of pain or anything you're looking to get some relief on. Um, it's full spectrum. Then also check out the gummy bears are delicious. Take them on the go and they act instantly. And, uh, tinctures, I think are the best bang for your buck. It's the strongest stuff and they got delicious flavors. Mints, my favorite, uh, there. And also, you know, check out the treats they have for your dogs cause they're awesome. And, uh, if you've got a little bit older dog like mine, uh, she really appreciates it and it's a lot easier on the joints and, um, and it just helps them relax and they really do. And they are, they must taste good because she really enjoys them. All right, Paloma Verde, CBD.com, promo code PEACE. Connor, what's going on with Iran? All right, so I'm going to start off today by talking about uh, what this new uh, French foreign minister, Catherine uh, Colonna, I think is how um, I'm going to go with the pronunciation today. Uh, And this is from July 12th. This is Jason Ditz at Antiwar.com. He says the new uh, French foreign minister uh, is warning that time is running out to revive the JCPOA and seems to be uh, blaming Tehran for the stalled negotiations. So she accuses of Iran. uh, uh, She accuses Iran of using delaying tactics and uh, reneging on previously agreed positions in Doha um, uh, during the Doha talks uh, while forging ahead with its uranium enrichment program. And she is quoted saying there is still a window of opportunity for Iran to finally decide to an ex- to accept an accord uh, which it worked to build. But time is passing. She warns further that if Iran keeps on its current trajectory, it would be a nuclear threshold state. Time is passing. Tehran must realize this, she says, adding that the approaching midterm elections in America will only make reaching a deal increasingly difficult. And she concludes the window of opportunity closes in a few weeks time and there is no deal coming that will be better than what's on the table already. All right. And now this is alarming, um, you know, because, uh, and I'll get into this just because, you know, specifically the EU, uh, have been much better on this in the past, but even we've heard, you know, in the last couple of weeks, Burrell has sounded more, um, you know, less optimistic about the outcome here. Uh, Iran has been keen to dismiss the artificial deadlines set by various Western officials during all these negotiations. Uh, Jake Sullivan has even said, well, they asked a U.S. official uh, if there really is a deadline, something like this, in response to her comments. And the U.S. official pointed to Sullivan's recent comment that uh, Washington hasn't set a a date on the calendar for what it's worth. Uh, The worrying thing here, of course, is that it shows the EU previously encouraging talks and salvaging them seems more and more pessimistic, blaming Iran for the lack of progress. Now, for its part, Iran blames the U.S. uh, for its contradictory policy of, on the one hand, saying they want to return to the deal, Biden saying he wants to restore the JCPOA, but while continuing Trump's policy, adding still more sanctions uh, and pressure. Okay. Now, Iran uh, has responded to this claim that Sullivan made that we covered last week about them arming uh, Russia with drones. And so Tehran uh, has fired back at Sullivan's accusations that the Iranians are preparing to provide the Russians with hundreds of drones and training for the war in Ukraine. Iran's new foreign ministry spokesman, Nasser uh, Kanani, said Moscow and Tehran have a history of cooperation dating back before the war in Ukraine. And though no such new uh, though no such uh, new deals have been made recently, as Sullivan suggests, uh, without evidence, 
so he's quoted as saying the history of cooperation between the Islamic Republic of Iran and the Russian Federation in the field of some new technologies dates back before the start of the war in Ukraine. And there has been no special development in the relationship recently. He also called out the hypocrisy of Washington's allegations. The claim uh, of the he, quote, the claim of the U.S. official comes while the United States and the Europeans have for years turned the occupying and aggressor countries, including in the West Asia region, into a storehouse for their various fatal weapons. Here's another interesting story, because I haven't seen uh, any indication of um, what the specifics are here since. But uh, Iran is saying that nuclear talks are uh, will be restarting soon. So uh, Iran says it remains committed to negotiations to save the JCPOA. This is from July 13th. Uh, so this new foreign ministry spokesman says talks will resume very soon with a date and time to be released in the coming days. It says the way to continue the negotiations and the place for negotiations is being discussed. Uh, he said, adding that foreign minister Hossein Amir Abdolian and lead nuclear negotiator Ali Bagari Khani are in constant contact with their European counterparts who are acting, of course, as the mediators between Tehran and Washington. Now, uh, Kanani's statement comes a day after the French foreign minister's warnings, warnings uh, that time to save the deal is running short. The Iranians say they will maintain their rightful and logical stance in, t in the talks. Iran continues pushing for straightforward deals built on the uh, 2015 JCPOA. By contrast, the U.S. pays lip service to the old deal, but appears happy to see Iran uh, resume its compliance with the deal so long as it doesn't have to deliver on promised sanctions relief or make the necessary concessions on the maximum pressure uh, campaign. All right, now here's some of the things that Biden was doing in the Middle East vis-a-vis -vis Iran. So he is now saying that... Uh, the U.S. will use force against Iran as a last resort. So this actually came just before the trip. Uh, in an interview with Israel's Channel 12 conducted in Washington before last week's Middle East trip, Biden said Washington would be willing to use force against Iran as a last resort. The interview aired the day Biden arrived in Israel. Biden was asked if he would use force against Iran's nuclear program, to which he replied, as a last resort, yes, adding Iran cannot get a nuclear weapon. Biden refused to discuss if he's received assurances from Tel Aviv that Israel wouldn't attack Iran's nuclear facilities without notifying uh, the U.S. first. I'm not going to discuss that, Biden said. Biden also said he would walk away and kill the deal if its restoration hinges on removing the IRGC from the foreign terrorist organization list. And that's a moot point anyway. Iran made the massive concession already and dropped the demand. And as uh, Dave DeCamp writes here, Ahead of the recent uh, indirect JCPOA negotiations with the U.S. and Doha, Iran reportedly dropped its demand to lift the IRGC designation, but talks made no progress, and the U.S. still accused Iran of making demands not related to the nuclear deal. The Biden administration has taken the position that any sanctions not related to Iran's nuclear program or the economic benefits Tehran is supposed to receive from the JCPOA cannot be lifted. But the Trump administration imposed an enormous number of sanctions on Iran after pulling out of the JCPOA. And during President Trump's final weeks in office, his administration added more sanctions with the goal of preventing Biden from being able to join the, GC the JCPOA. Now, this gets to the larger point that the IRGC issue was not the only sticking point preventing a deal. It was also a major dispute over the extent, uh, the extent of sanctions relief, verification, and guarantees on economic benefits. The Biden administration's deceitfulness and general intransigence has made resolving these underlying issues virtually impossible. So, however, Biden's administration essentially acts as if it's the IRGC FTO designation and the disagreement over this issue is uh, what has sunk the deal. And the optics are meant to make Biden look tough and pro-Israel while painting the Iranians as irrational, even though their demand was rational and reasonable. And what it, this actually proves is that Biden and his men were the ones hoping to see, see the deal tanked, even though they knew uh, this was a superfluous sanction. Um, in April, uh, Antony Blinken told lawmakers that blacklisting the IRGC has a negligible impact. He said, as a practical matter, the designation does not really gain you much because there are myriad other sanctions on the IRGC. Blinken said. But according to Politico, by the end of that month, uh, Biden had already decided that he wasn't going to budge on the issue, um, even though it's so, uh, you know, meaningless at this, you know, when you consider that they have sanctions on them for what, election interference and ballistic missiles and human rights um, 
uh, issues. And then also they've been a designated global terrorist organization since uh, the end of the Bush administration. So um, this is just, uh, you know, a massive insult and something they could have easily, as Rand Paul pointed out to Robert Malley, they could have easily dropped this and, uh, you know, perhaps move forward on some of the things the U.S. wants. Although I think it's highly unlikely because what the U.S. really wants is them to make massive concessions on their ballistic missile program and their regional policies, their support for their allies. And, um, you know, Iran would be suicidal to do that. All right. But it could have moved the deal forward and they could have gotten if they do really want to return to the deal. Obviously, they could have achieved that. OK, so now uh, Biden and Yair Lapid have signed a joint U.S.-Israel declaration against Iran. Biden signed a joint declaration in Jerusalem with acting Israeli Prime Minister Yair Lapid, and it includes threats against Iran over the phony nuclear threat. The U.S.-Israel Strategic Partnership Joint Declaration says the U.S. would use all of its national power to stop Tehran from arming itself with a nuclear weapon. Uh, quote, the United States stresses that integral to this pledge is the commitment never to allow Iran to acquire a nuclear weapon and that it, and that it is prepared to use all elements of its national power to ensure that outcome. The declaration reads, and this highlights the discordant nature of the U.S. Iran policy. So the Iranians have been in the MPT since 1970. And they were verified by the IAEA in 11 separate reports after 2015 to be in complete compliance with the JCPOA before Trump illegally exited the agreement. Even though the U.S. and the Israelis have repeated attacked Iran since then, Tehran remains steadfastly committed to restoring the JCPOA. Additionally, the Iranians have never attempted to gain nuclear weapons, and the current Ayatollah issued a fatwa forbidding this as, re as recently as 2003. Meanwhile, the Israelis have 200 nuclear weapons, according to whistleblower Mordecai Venunu. But even this threatening declaration wasn't enough for the Israelis. Lapid told Biden, Words will not stop them, Mr. President. Diplomacy will not stop them. The only thing that will stop Iran is knowing that if they continue to develop their nuclear program, the free world will use force. The only way to stop them is to put a credible military threat on the table. It should not be a bluff, but the real thing. The Iranian regime must know if they continue to deceive the world, they will pay a heavy price. Opposition leader and former Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said, we've been friends for 40 years, but to ensure the next 40 years, we must deal with the Iranian threat. There must be a credible offensive military option. I told him the JCPOA deal is lousy. He knows my position. I told him that with no credible military option, Iran won't be stopped. If Iran isn't deterred, the military option has to be used. At a news conference uh, with Lapid uh, following private talks about Iran's nuclear program, Biden said the U.S. has laid out for Tehran a path to return to the nuclear deal and awaits a response. When that will come, I'm not certain, Biden said, but we're not going to wait forever. Biden claims he prefers diplomacy, but his actions indicate otherwise. Biden has had nearly two years to restore the JCPOA. Instead, he's piled on sanctions, stolen and sold Iranian oil while tacitly endorsing Israel's myriad attacks inside Iran, including sabotaging nuclear facilities, drone strikes and various assassinations. The declaration reaffirms uh, Washington's support for the Memorandum of Understanding that gives Israel $3.8 billion uh, in military aid per year, originally signed in 2016. The Memorandum of Understanding lasts through 2028, though the declaration expresses support for a follow-on uh, MOU. Okay. Now, um, we now have a, a advisor to the Ayatollah saying that Iran has the technical means to build a nuclear bomb, but they have still not chosen uh, to move forward on that. So on Sunday, uh, one of Khamenei's advisors, um, Kamal uh, Karazi, uh, the head of Iran's Strategic Foreign Relations Council said Tehran has the technical means to build a nuclear weapon, but is still not decided to do so. In a, a quote, in a few days, we were able to enrich uranium up to 60 percent and we can easily produce 90 percent enriched uranium. Iran has the technical means to produce a nuclear bomb, but there has been no decision by Iran to build one. Uh, Karazi uh, told uh, Al Jazeera. His comments might be seen as an effort to bring Washington back to the negotiating table. However, he also said Washington's inability to prevent a repeat of Trump's actions in 2018 uh, have ruined the chances of a restored deal. Quote, the United States has not provided guarantees on preserving the nuclear deal, and this ruins the possibility of any agreement. Uh, Karazi said Tehran would never negotiate its ballistic missile program or its regional policy as demanded by the West and its Middle Eastern allies. 
In an apparent reference to Israel's myriad threats to attack Iran's nuclear facilities, he added, any targeting of our security from neighboring countries will be met with a direct response to these countries and Israel. While Tel Aviv incessantly claims Iran is racing to develop uh, a bomb, Tehran has maintained a policy against developing weapons of mass destruction for decades, and there's still no indication that that has changed. The, uh, now we have the Israeli military chief saying that their main focus uh, is preparations to strike Iran. So on Monday, we have the IDF chief of staff, Aviv uh, uh, Kok- uh, Kokovi, uh, who has said that Israel's military, pri- uh, the Israeli military's primary focus is attacking Iran's nuclear program, as reported in Haaretz. Uh, quote, preparing a military operation against the Iranian nuclear program is a moral necessity and a national security imperative, uh, Kokovi said at the handover ceremony for the head of the IDF's home front command. Last year, Kokovi said the IDF was accelerating its plan to strike Iran's nuclear facilities. And of course, we covered earlier this year, they, uh, sim- they did these month-long chariots of fire exercises that included in the last week um, a, a, a long uh, ext- a practice, or excuse me, a military drill uh, simulating repeated airstrikes on Iran's nuclear facilities over the Mediterranean Sea. The, the drill spanned 10,000 kilometers, included more than 100 uh, military aircraft, um, Navy submarines, uh, etc. And um, so, and he's now he's saying uh, he has called the JCPOA a bad deal and says that the agreement allows Iran to become a nuclear state within a short time after its end date. Of course, Iran would still be a non-proliferation treaty uh, signatory, which Tel Aviv refuses uh, to sign because of its sec- secret nuclear weapons arsenal. So unlike Israel, after the deal expires, Iran will remain subject to the IAEA uh, safeguards agreement and uh, inspections. So that's uh, that's essentially the update on what's been going on with Iran right now. Um, I'm wait, I'm waiting to see uh, and most curious to see what the reaction will be to uh, Kameni's advisor uh, making this claim about how they have the technical means to go ahead uh, with um, – well – they have the ability to do this. I think that is certainly a negotiating tactic, um, and uh, and this makes uh, a lot of. I mean, it's going to be painted as if they are racing toward a bomb, unfortunately. But at this point, um, they're treated that way anyway, and they need to uh, restart talks in earnest. Now, hopefully, the back channel discussions with the Europeans uh, will help to uh, facilitate a return to talks, whether in Doha or Vienna. However, you know, these comments from the French foreign minister may seem alarming and they are. But at the same time, I think truthfully, it's been more or less the EU, uh, you know, broker. Well, the EU foreign policy chief, Joseph Burrell, and then the broker, Enrique Mora, the, the nuclear negotiator there uh, who, uh, f- you know, brokered all the talks in Vienna and has gone to Tehran previously to restart uh, talks and break deadlock. Uh, that have been more engaged in actually trying to bring uh, the various parties, namely the U.S. and, and Iran especially, to uh, the table. Um, Iran has always been uh, you know, ready to continue discussions, but the U.S. You know, looks for issues like the IRGC uh, issue at this, you know, is most notably right now, uh, to use as the excuse for why things aren't moving forward when it's really their policy and all this hype. I mean, building up um, for all, you know, I mean, th- this comment, um, by the Iranians here about the uh, the technical means to achieve a, a nuclear weapon. Um, you know, they're very specific about how they're not actually doing that. However, I think it's it's it's, you know, incentivized by this constant policy of encircling Iran while they're being attacked constantly. I mean, while Biden was in the U.S., he made no uh, efforts to, you know, I mean, and we didn't expect this, but of course, it wasn't even addressed or at least I haven't seen it, um, that they uh, talked about Israel's assassination, recent assassination campaign where they potentially killed uh, six people uh, and all their drone strikes on Iran this year. Um, they, I mean, the, the, all of that has this, you know, essentially a, a, t- a full tacit endorsement uh, by the Biden administration. And Israel has a free, um, you know, has, an, a, has a, a blank check to do whatever they want. And they know that if they do start uh, conflict with Iran, uh, even before they have this, you know, <laughs> this Middle East Air Defense Alliance thing all put together. Uh, it does. It's not clear to me how much any of that moved forward during this trip. 
uh, that Biden made last week. Um, but uh, I, I think that the mo- what is alarming is that when Biden says I haven't discussed with the- I'm not going to discuss if they've given me any assurances uh, that they wouldn't attack Iran without notifying the U.S. Uh, ahead of time. I think that is very concerning because uh, they know that regardless of if they did or not, the U.S. would absolutely come to their defense. And so in that sense, um, just like the rest of the policy, Israel is I mean, what Israel wants is is infinitely more important, it seems, than what Iran is actually doing. Uh, And that creates a very dangerous situation because it's it strongly benefits all these regional players uh, that are lining that are backed by the U.S. and Israel to just continue raising tensions in order to get, you know, more military welfare. And and Israel, of course, has their, uh, you know, uh, quantitative military edge. The U.S. has this policy so that whatever new arms are thrown over to these Gulf dictatorships, Israel gets, you know, double that to ensure that they have dominance in the region. So all of this is just um, moving forward in a horrible uh, direction, as we could have predicted. Um, but I think um, we should know very soon if – I mean, I, I'm optimistic at least that the Iranians are saying they're going to restart the talk soon. But then again, that was a week ago. And they said that they would have that information, the date and the time, et cetera, uh, within a few days. And that is not uh, – we have not seen anything like that. So, I mean, it's very possible that Biden – de facto killed the deal and any chances of returning to it during this trip uh, with all this, um, all these threats with the Israelis, these formal threats. Um, and uh, and maybe that's what we're seeing with the Iranians saying uh, this stuff about how they have uh, the technical means to achieve a weapon. It could be a last gas effort, effort to get them back to the table, but it could also be, uh, you know, a way of saying, uh, well, just basically, I mean, what they've, you know, it's, it's, it's referencing that they could, like the French foreign minister said, be a nuclear threshold state. I mean, the big concern is that they get goaded out of the MPT uh, or that they get backed into a corner uh, where they do, you know, I, and I think it's extremely unlikely uh, that they would leave the MPT or that they would pursue uh, weapon, uh, nuclear weapons. But at the same time, if it's the only way to protect, um, you know, the state of Iran, uh, and it's, it's, it, this is all an existential threat, which it certainly is. Um, anything is possible, you know, they may just decide to, um, and, and you know, as a way of just national, pure national survival. So, um, that is, uh, as things stand right now, I think. All right, Connor, I got, uh, quite a few new, or not a few, just a couple new stories to go through. Uh, contradicting Biden, Saudi foreign minister says opening airspace to Israel flights is not a step towards normalizing. And so this is, I think, just goes towards Biden's trip toward to the Middle East and how much of a failure it was. Uh, we see he can't even get, uh, what are supposed to be the, you know, two main actors here, Israel and Saudi Arabia on the same page on even the most basic statements uh this having to do with you know is the increasingly normal relationship between israel and saudi arabia normalizing ties in any official way i guess saudi arabia politically doesn't like it so they're saying no but it it does seem that that cooperation is increasing this also happened with the jamal khashoggi situation where Biden insisted he brought it up to the crown prince and uh, the Saudis are saying that Biden just, you know, gave like a general condemnation and nothing all that specific to Khashoggi, which I'm honestly guessing is more of the case, although Biden did deny that 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 was true. So just a a little bit more on Biden's trip to the Middle East. Uh, We have the House voting to expand NATO into Finland and Sweden. Now, my understanding is, you know, constitutionally, the way it works, the Senate is the only branch that has to ratify a treaty. So it's not as though if the, the House voted this down here would have actually been a block or opposition uh, but this does go to show the the level of support Ukraine NATO has in the house uh, the vote was 394 to 18 with only Republicans voting in opposition and so this isn't a surprise I'm guessing that we're going to see uh, the Senate vote soon and unfortunately Rand Paul is going to uh, neuter himself and just vote present. The IMF has issued a warning saying that a deep recession will strike Europe 
if uh, the U.S. cuts gas supply to uh if russia cuts its gas supply to europe and so the particular countries that are of concern are uh the imf warning about our hungary slovakia the czech republic and italy imf researchers said in a blog post that it would uh hurt most uh that hungary would hurt most from losing access to russian gas and could face over a six percent loss in gross domestic product since turkey is so relying on russian energy as president Viktor yorban said Cured an exemption from the EU ban on Russian oil. Orban is less hostile towards Russia than most of the EU, so it's possible Hungary could be spared from Russian gas embargo unless Moscow decided to cut supply to the entire bloc. So far, Russia has cut some EU members over their refusal to pay for gas in rubles, and other supplies have been reduced due to Western sanctions. The IMF says the economic plan uh, pain could be offset if EU nations step up cooperation to share alternative supplies under IMS best case scenario Germany Europe's largest economy will shrink its GDP by 1% in the die scenario Germany's GDP will be reduced by nearly 3% the EU is expecting Russia to cut off its gas supplies and is working on plans for energy cuts which are expected to be proposed by the European Commission, according to the Associated Press. Uh, early leads of the proposal say they want to reduce their consumption of gas by 15%. Connor, this is an absolute train wreck, and it's all for this failed policy of regime change in Russia and ultimately attempting you know, to weaken Russia in Ukraine. It's uh, shocking to me how far they've gone with all of this. Uh, you know, at some point, you really think that they're going to pull this back in, that they're going to start to adopt a more realistic policy. And we, I guess we did see that some this week with the Europeans saying that they were changing up some of their sanctions and allowing some uh, Russian banks to, to be unsanctioned and freeing up some of those assets to facilitate uh, food transfers to Africa and other countries. That's great. You know, that is a, a step in the right direction. But overall here, Connor, is just is shockingly disappointing uh you you would think at some point you know people would start to wake up start to develop more realistic policies but really we haven't seen that maybe once the economic pain starts to step up we'll see more and i do think this uh point here gives a little bit of credence to an argument made by scott horton and aramate and that is russia probably could have avoided this conflict by trying to exact this economic pain by cutting off energy first rather than uh, going with the military intervention route. Now, look, maybe we're going to be proven wrong on that, and Europe is really willing to suffer the pain of losing out on Russian energy uh, in exchange to uh, attempt to weaken Russia and expand NATO into Ukraine, but that really seems unlikely to me, Connor. But, uh, you know, maybe we'll figure it out if Russia really does ramp up and cut off energy into Europe. Uh, we will see what the Europeans do and how committed they are to Ukraine. Uh, there's also another note today. I didn't have an article on this, but uh, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov made a very important statement saying that because of the Western uh, weapons transfers to Ukraine, Russia had expanded its mission into Ukraine. Now, I'm sure there are some people who believe that this is just cover, that Russia always meant to do more, and now they're just using that. This is an excuse. It's potential, but I also think that this is probably a legitimate response uh, from Russia to the Western weapons transfers. They've been making a lot of threats about the weapons transfers, and so this is maybe one they can actually or at least believe they could follow through on. Uh, but, Connor, I think that's probably a great – oh, I want to mention – there, there was also this pretty big case, I guess, uh, more important economically than politi geopolitically, uh, but both Russia and Trinidad and Tobago were potentially going to be hit with dumping penalties from the U.S. related to urea trade, which is used in fertilizer. 
I don't know uh, why the U.S. ended up not putting on those penalties, but they backed off from it. And so that may have something to do with the, the global uh, fertilizer. And uh, I, I think we do see some places, again, where the West isn't really quite so committed to the economic war against Russia because they understand how steep and severe the consequences could be. Uh, but that's where we'll wrap up today, Connor. Thank you so much uh, for coming back on the show. And uh, it'll, it'll probably be a couple weeks uh, before me and Connor have another show again. Uh, next week, I got some pre-recorded episodes for y'all. Uh, the One of our colleagues at the Libertarian Institute, Keith Knight, has a brand new book out that I interview him on. Uh, but Connor, thank you so much, and we'll do this again soon. Sounds good. Thanks, Kyle. Thanks, everybody.